Hello dear students, welcome to EPG Pakshala. I am Gagandeep Kaur, Assistant Professor, Khalsa College of Education, Ranjit Avenue, Amritsar. The topic of present module is Development of Educational Administration in India in Pre-British Era Historical Perspective. After completion of this module, learners will have a clear picture of structure of educational administration in pre-British era during Vedic period. They will be able to understand the educational administration during Buddhist period. Students will be able to know about the educational administration during Muslim period. Role of various ancient universities in the propagation of education. Attitude of Muslim invaders towards education. Role of Muslim and Hindu kings in strengthening the education in India. So, first of all, we have to understand the term educational administration. It cannot be studied as an isolated discipline. Its historical development cannot be studied in an excluded form. That is, without referencing it to the history of the nation. Because we all know that our cultural, social and political background of the nation has put the strong influence on the nature of our educational administrative patterns. So, educational administration is dependent upon the system of the country. Educational administration is an old concept, but its expansion and growth is very rapid in recent centuries. The organizational structures of educational administration are undergoing changes with the changing times and getting themselves modernized to meet the complicated needs of the present society. Will students, the historical development of educational administration of India is quite interesting. Mukherjee says that the study of the development of educational administration of this country is indeed fascinating. Yet, anyone familiar with this development cannot help being impressed with the complexities of administering an adequate and forward-looking program of education. Well, in order to understand how education is being administered in India today, it is necessary to know how it has been administered in the past. The study of the administrative history would not only trace the gradual evolution of the present administrative setup, but would at the same time show how we should reform ourselves. So students, Indian education has undergone several changes in different well-set periods. So the oldest system of our educational pattern was involved in the Vedic period. At that time, Education was not under the control of the state as public education. It was not deemed to be the business of the state in those days. There was neither constraint nor taxation for the educational purposes. Education was more or less governed by the religious doctrines. In the earlier days, the traditions, customs and practices were being delivered verbally from one generation to another. The priests, rishis and seers were used to memorize the scriptures. Then there was a trend to impart the knowledge to their words and to those who come to seek such knowledge. It was a part of their dharma. Teachers as well as the pupils were used to follow this trend. There had been royal patronage in abundance, but complete academic and administrative freedom had been prevalent. According to Altaker, the state in ancient India, however, did not attempt to control education because it was liberally subsidizing it. Kings were giving grants to all institutions without caring to control their policy or curricula. So students, it was in the Sutra period where the educational administration of India really began. In this period, the responsibility for education of the young children was transferred from the parents to the teachers who were really specialized in the teaching. So basically, three types of agencies of education were prevailing. That is Gurukuls, Parishads and Samelan. So students, first of all here we will discuss the Gurukuls. Gurukuls or ashrams were the houses of the Guru or Acharya placed in natural surroundings and away from the noise of the residential areas. 
So the parents were used to send their wards to these ashrams at the age of 5 to 9 years according to their caste. Their pupils were given the training under the supervision and guidance of their gurus. Gurukuls were the residential schools and student had to live there during the stay of his whole education. Second is Parishads. Parishads were the educational institutions just like colleges of the modern world where different subject teachers used to teach. Parishads had been used for the conferences of learned persons and generally their assemblings were held for deliberations upon different philosophical problems. So other one is Samelan. In this type of educational institution, scholars are used to gather at one place for discussions on the invitation of the king and then the scholars were appropriately awarded. All these institutions were free and supported by the gifts of philanthropists. The teachers and the students were made fully independent of all the economic worries. But the state or the people had no control on all these. It was the chancellor or the acharya who was the chief person. The kings and the rulers did donate liberal grants to the educational institutions, but never opened educational institutes under their own management. Only the Parishad's institutions were organized. Vrihadinak Upanishad mentioned the existence of at least two such Parishads in the upper Gangetic Valley, namely the Kuru and the Panchal Parishad. So students, the questions like what was the manner of functioning of such Parishads and whether these were a sort of federal universities has still to be find out. But one thing is certain that they helped in the standardization of ashrams. Ashrams were not isolated, sometimes they evolved as what may be called as teacher colonies and the whole colonies grew up into a sort of super organization. That such colonies existed in Varanasi, Kanjivaram, etc. I hope that from the above discussion, a little picture of the educational administration in India in ancient Hindu period is clear to you. Next, we will discuss about the educational administration of the Buddhist period. Buddhism was evolved in India after ancient Hindu period. This religion made new converts, but not by the force, but through teaching and persuasion. This needed preachers of both sexes who would not only be well educated themselves, but be able to devote their whole time to teaching. This naturally required the practicing of celibacy and living inside the monasteries and vihars, or we can call them as pre-universities. These vihars were residential in nature and instructions were given not only to the monks but to the laymen also. More definite information is available for Buddhist universities like Nalanda and Vikramshila in Bihar and Tamrilipt in Bengal and Vallabhi in Gujarat. These universities did not possess any kind of organizational structure of modern type nor were they controlled by any kind of administrative organization. Altiker pointed out that it may be observed at the outset, Taksila did not possess any colleges or the university in the modern sense of the term. It was simply a center of education. In all these universities, there were both secular as well as religious courses. They were mostly admitting the monks and sometimes persons from the Hindu faith as well. They were not only free and residential but being maintained out of the grants of income from several villages. Like in the case of Nalanda University, grants were provided by near about 134 villages. So students, you come to know how these universities were administered with the help of journal public. But Students, it is very important to mention that these universities maintained definite standards and admitted students who could pass the entrance test held by their Dwara Pandits. Thus, the autonomy of the Buddhist universities, their administration was fostered by a sort of democratic control of the teachers themselves. There is also some evidence of an outside control by the Buddhist order which organized conferences to settle teaching. 
they were having the right to transfer teachers from one university to another. The organization of the Viharas was somewhat similar to the universities being vested in the chief monk. There they were assisted by a number of senior monks. The administration, both journal and academic of these universities was simply superb. In these universities, thousands of novices gathered for getting knowledge and there they were taught by a galaxy of professors. So students, these residential universities were providing food and accommodation. These universities were having the environment which could refresh the body and mind. Their main focus was to provide spiritual awakening. So, even in the Buddhist period, the Hindu educational system, that is Brahmanic types, coexisted in their educational system. During that period, temple colleges were established and their curriculum was mainly focused on the religion. The revival of Hinduism marked the rise of Hindu educational institutions, but which were lacking in cohesion and solidarity. It thus marked a period which paved the way for an easy conquest by the Muslim invaders. So students, till now we have discussed about the educational administration in Hindu and Buddhist era. Next, we will discuss about the educational administration during Muslim period. There was difference between the manner in which state patronage was exercised in favor of educational institutions during the Hindu and Muslim period. Land grants were given by Hindu princes personally, but the Muslim rulers appointed a special minister for this purpose that was called Sardaru Sadar. He was the minister of justice as well as the chief of ulemas or Muslim religious teachers. Historians like Jafar expressed that this was done by the slave rulers, the earlier sultans, simply to buy the powerful support of Muslim ulemas in favor of the royal throne. Because the slave kings being denied an aristocratic lineage had to depend on religious teachers for the support of their throne. Thus, the practice of interesting patronage of educational institutions to special ministers continued in slaves during the Khilji, Tughlaq and Lodi dynasties and even in the Mughal period right up to at the least the period of Farooq Siyar. The picture had considerably changed during the Middle Ages. The Muslim rulers like Qutbuddin, Mubarak Khan, Firoz Tughlaq, Akbar and Deccan kings exhibited keen interest in educational matters. However, the credit for organizing a systematic education goes to the uneducated Muslim emperor Akbar. According to Aini Akbari, though Akbar tried to curtail the parts of Sadar o Sadar, he did not entirely abolish this office. There was just a few small gaps one was during the reign of Balban, when it seems that this office was ineffective. And another was during the reign of Allahuddin Khilji, this post was abolished. During the reign of the Sayyids, also this post had no job to perform. Well, Mughal ruler Aurangzeb acted positively towards a Muslim education and negatively towards Hindu education. He followed a different policy from Akbar with regard to Hindu educational institutions. For instance, in 1669, he ordered the provincial governors to destroy the Hindu schools and temples within their jurisdiction. But he spent lavishly on Muslim education. He appointed teachers and provided funds for the setup of educational institutions. During the Muslim rule of Delhi, there was a definite bureaucratic organization to distribute patronage to educational institutions, though they merely extended this patronage only to the Muslim institutions. These Muslim institutions were of two kinds. The elementary schools were called the maktabs and the more advanced ones were called as madrasas. They were run by Muslim theologians and hence religious teaching was compulsory. Some of the madrasas have taught some secular subjects like medicine. In Muslim educational era, education was free and journaling 
non-residential. The administrative function of the state, however, ended with the award of grants, which in most of the cases were land grants, fetching an annual income for the maintenance of the institutions. This ensured permanence to the institutions, but there was no check against the deterioration of their standards. Moreover, the institutions lacked cohesion and coordination. Therefore, there was a great diversity in the standards among the educational institutions at different places. Unlike the Parishads of the early Hindu period or the Sangh of the Buddhist period, there was no centralizing agency. The state ceased to function once the endowment was granted. The order of Muslim ulemas did not bother much about the quality of teaching available at the centers. It simply agitated for more centers being opened so that more teachers might be employed. Probably it was partly due to the fact that activities were never conducted through persuasion and education but by the sword of Islamic rulers. Number of Muslim institutions were opened at various places under the patronage of the Sultans of Delhi and later on by the local autonomous rulers of the Bahamani Empire of the states that emerged out of this empire, as well as by the rulers of Bengal, Jonpur, Sin, and Kashmir in the early period and under the patronage of the Nizam of Hyderabad. Nawab of Bengal at the end of the Mughal period. This shows the evidence of well-organized system of the spread of education by the Hinduism, which seems to show that there was a definite state policy for opening more and more schools. As for the others, it seems the whole thing was left to the rulers. Some enlightened rulers did open schools, while many of the successors did not do anything. Land once granted often continued and the institutions once opened had some sort of permanence. But in the absence of any coordinating policy, there was neither any check against deteriorating standards nor was any effort made to remove isolation. The curriculum thus narrowed down to the study of elements of language, usually Arabic, and the study of Quran. A few muktabs started teaching Urdu in the Mughal period and onwards. As a rule, the Muslims were not in favor of separating education among the females beyond the elementary stage, though we find records of ladies of some of the royal courts being quite enlightened. Like Razia Begum during the early Sultanate of Delhi, Gulshan Begum and Jebunisa during the Mughal rule and Chand Bibi of Ahmednagar were highly educated ladies. So, students, they educated not only in language and arts, but in politics as well. In Fatehpur Sikri and in Ahmednagar, there were special sites for schools for ladies within the harem. Muslim rulers were generally hostile to the spread of education through Hindu institutions. Their hostility was more manifest in the destruction of Hindu temples and especially the educational institutions attached to them. Well, students, according to the Bakatena Siri, Nalanda was destroyed being mistaken for a foot. As we have discussed that Nalanda was one of the reputed institutions of that time. Occasionally, some enlightened rulers especially Janul Abadin of Kashmir in 13th century and Akbar in 16th century did patronize the opening of Hindu institutions. And rulers like Feroz Shah Tughlaq opened a bureau for translation of Sanskrit texts into Persian, a practice which was later followed by Akbar. But students, on the whole, we can say that the attitude of Muslim rulers to the Hindu educational institutions was generally apathetic rather than hostile, unless they happened to be attached to the temples. Thus, this reduced the number of temple colleges in the areas under Muslim rule and favored opening teacher colonies, imparting a sort of more mundane type of education, especially in northern India. These were generally open in such areas where 
there were wealthy Hindus to patronize them either through land grants or through well-settled grants paid on the occasion of social ceremonies or annual religious festivals. So, such centers in the north were there like Varanasi, Mithila and a few small centers at Kanoj, Mutra and others also existed. The local colonies tried to maintain some standards but were isolated and there were very mutual jealousies between two centers. In the far south, the land was free from Muslims and hence temple colleges stopped not only in Kanjiviram, Madura and other places but also in the regions less accessible to Muslims like Thrupati and Tharwar. But these also suffered from lack of cohesion and coordination even during the enlightened rule of some of the rulers of Vijayanagar Empire probably because some of these became citadels of rival faiths, Shevas and Vaishnavas and were engaged in mutual opposition. With the fall of Mughal Empire, two powerful non-Muslim administrations arose. Students, one was that of the Sikhs in the north and the other was that of Marathas in the south. The main objectives of Sikhism towards education were to bring social change. So, they consider that education promotes eternal values, promotes capacity to welcome social change, transmission of culture, removal of obstacles and education is meant for spreading knowledge. It should stabilize democratic values, control, channelizes and modifies thoughts of new generation. Other one is awareness against social evils. But much work in development of proper administrative system was not carried out. Well, the second force, the Marathas and other hand were different. Though illiterate himself, Shivaji did realize the value of education and made one of his ministers responsible for the award of annual subsidies in the shape of Dakshina grants. This was a departure from older methods of land endowment made by either the Hindus or the Muslims. To a certain extent, it was required by the conditions of Maratha state where good cultivate lands were always in demand to feed the Maratha soldiers. Consequently, they could not be blocked by being given over to educational institutions. It also suited the variable finances of the Marathas for they could adjust the amount of grant that was available. But besides this, it had one good point in support of it. It provided a means of annual assessment of the efficiency of the institutions. Though we know very little about the immediate successors of Shivaji, it is definite that Peshwas, who became the ultimate successor of the vast Maratha power, did continue the practice and organized annual conferences whereby the grants were dispersed according to the ability of the participants. When Baji Rao II was deposed, the amount of money dispersed as grants through Pune ministry was something like two and a half lakhs in Indian currency. Thus, at the end of the Muslim rule, we find that though educational institutions existed at various places, they lacked both cohesion and coordination with varying standards for they were all issued a fixed grant mostly through the income from endowed lands. This was true both for Hindu and Muslim institutions. Within the Maratha empire alone, some sort of efficiency was maintained through Dakshina grants which were liable to vary. Corruption interviews and nepotism, however, affected their proper and equitable disbursement. And it was not always that consideration of justice alone settled the amount of grants that were paid. Well, students, to conclude, we can quote Mukherjee, who rightly observes, it may, however, be noted that during the pre-British days, 
are state administrative machinery of the modern type did not exist and education was self-controlled. That historical background tells that there arose no need for development of any kind of state administrative system of education either in ancient times or in medieval times. So students, I hope that now you are familiar with the educational administration during the pre-British era. But some of the state interference had been noticed in the medieval ages and this was only in the recent centuries that the direct responsibility of the public education by the state and external controlling system have evolved to see that whether the funds provided are properly utilized and instruction is efficiently offered. Thank you so much for watching and I hope that the topic is now clear to you.